So, um, so I wanted to pick up. I guess I should be in the word of prayer before I forget. Do want to give the internet its way? You know, what's that? Okay. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day, and thank you for the students, and for this semester. Just ask you to bless our work today. Help us to find the error of my ways. Amen. So hopefully I have an error. I really want there to be an error because I want that theorem to be true that we looked at the proof of last time because, well, I don't know what would be wrong with my proof. So here's, I went trying to construct the algebra um, with unit 1, 2. So what should be true is we should have 1, 2, AB equal to AB for all AB, right? For example, we should have 1, 2 times 1, 2 is 1, 2. And then, just to keep things simple, I decided to make the imaginary unit um, 0, 1. So but what I'm trying to do is to create a non-standard presentation of the complex numbers. Basically, a uh, uglification of the complex numbers, right? Like, you could do all complex math in terms of this notation. It would just make things, like, way uglier than they actually are. So it would be stupid. Anyway, let's get stupid together. So 0, 1 times 0, 1 is supposed to be minus the identity. That's what makes i, i. So that times that should be minus 1, minus 2. Um, also, scalar multiplication is scalar multiplication. And so, let's see here how to say this. There's something, I mean, essentially, how to say this. Um, all right, we got to find, there's, there's an error in here somewhere, so be critical. Let's see here. It's a commutative, but not associative. So there, there should be a, there's, there's got to be an error somewhere then. I, I just, um, um, well, I mean, I believe you if that's what you found, but um, I also believe that there, sh there should be somewhere in here an error that led to that, because I, I think you should be able to, you ought to be able to make a copy of the complex numbers using that as the identity and, you know, 0, 1 is the i. It's just going to make the formula for the multiplication unfamiliar. But I, you know, let, <clears throat> you what, you what, think what? Yeah, I just, I, I, I wonder if there's an error somewhere in my construction of these products, yeah. I don't know. Um. <sighs> All right, so um, so here's the sneaky thing, and my, Bill, my my brother gave me this idea just to do this. A comma B is so you want to make the identity appear, right? So if you add and subtract two A there, voila, there's the A times one two, and then over here like that. Now, of course, this is, oh, maybe that's it. Huh. Huh. I guess that's the question I have to ask myself. Can I have standard scalar multiplication? And can I also have the identity element in the algebra be 1, 2? So.
then that's not what I'm trying to construct. So it is a problem. But I mean, so maybe this is the error of my way. Okay, so scalar, how does scalar multiplication work in R2? Scalar multiplication. We have to have A times B times XY, right? Equals to AB. XY, right? So um, on the other hand, one times XY is equal to XY, right? But I'm saying that that's also equal to 1, 2 times x, y. Um, I wonder if that's the error. Say again, what? I have what? So if, if we still have the distributed property, right? Uh-huh. So, so subtract both sides, your far right and your far left, collectively. Um, so then you have 0 equals 1, 2 xy minus 1 xy. So then, I mean, the thing is, how is, does that necessarily work? Because we can't really compare a unit. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, so in the ordinary case, I don't even think about doing this, right? But we do stuff like three times one plus i, right? We think, oh, well, that's that's three plus three i, right? So making the usual identifications. What happens? Well, we've got, you know, so if I make the identity just be doing something wrong. I think I'm doing something wrong in my construction. I'm not, well, okay, so let me think about this, guys. So I think I, I kind of, well, scalar multiplication works. see here. All right, so I say E2 times E2 is minus 1 minus 2, E1 times E2. So what do I do? I take E1, I add and subtract 2 E2 from it to get myself proper, prop, um, like 1 comma 2 times E2, which then gives me E2. 2 E2 E2 is <laughs> minus a minus 1 minus 2, which is that, and then I add, so I get 1 comma 3. And then E1, E1 works out to minus 3 comma minus 10, allegedly. If, what's that? So scalar multiplication, now you're saying scalar multiplication does not work. Hmm. So you're saying, ah, ah. okay, so if I can say it in words, so we have, you have like C 
times element v element w so like this versus this right and they're not the same so this is supposed to be and the the, the, the larger thing is that c times v right should also be equal to um, c comma 2c times v right i mean because that's um, i mean c times v is also supposed to be c times 1 we should also be able to do that right i mean But this is where you see the problem, because how do you see the problem? So you're okay. So you're saying that. Uh, I need scalar multiplication to be standard, though, because. I mean, if you do it like facing a complex figure. Um, uh, um, where what? So you're just like understanding it. It works for like. Can you like do construction? Like you're kind of converting like the base into like a complex number. Oh, that's the isomorphism. Yeah. Um, so, the because. Oh, come on. Good. You okay? I'm not I'm sorry. I I um Oh. It's okay. But the, the larger point is some the scale of which we get blocks. It works. <laughs> this is just a roller coaster of emotion for me. Um <laughs> uh See, I'm, I, I, I'm generally skeptical. There's something wrong here, OK? I, I'm not sure what it is yet, but let's figure it out. <laughs> um, let me show you why I'm worried about it being right. Suppose it was right, all right? So I work out these products, which may, may, may or may not make, may be compounding an error to an error. I don't know. If I haven't made an error, then this is the multiplication table for an algebra which has unit 1, 2 and imaginary unit 0, 1. As you can see, nothing behaves as the identity in this multiplication table because the identity is not there. And here's a generic multiplication. A, B, X, Y works out like that. I'm just calculating to try to better understand what I'm doing. I don't know if I really needed to do this or not, but here it is. I just multiply out E1, 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 E2, E2, E2 is this, 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 which gives me this, which gives me that, which there's you go, there's the regular representation um, for this algebra. Again, it's not a very convenient regular representation. I can't easily read Cauchy Riemann equations from this, right? I don't know about you, I can't. Usually we have stuff like A, A, B, minus B. So like, oh, look, this has to be equal to that. And that has to be minus that. Like, no, no such luck here, right? So this is where the sort of symmetric cauchy riemann equations are much nicer. See, because the symmetric cauchy riemann equations, which I, I call these the symmetric cauchy riemann equations because they, they, have, they don't play favorites. There's no expectation that anything's a unit or anything special. It just says that the algebra multiplication and partial differentiation is related in this way. And this sort of the most plain Jane, you know, straight, not specialized Cauchy Riemann equations that I can, I can come up with. Um, anyway, so 
then, but this and that, that's just by definition, this and that, because that's what we mean by partial derivatives. And um, so then this is multiplying e1, 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 e2, e2, e1, e2, e2, we assume commutative. And so we get that. So there's your uh, two equations in four unknowns, the cauchy riemann equations that we studied from a sort of structure constant viewpoint last time. Here they are. These are the A Cauchy Riemann equations for this algebra. And so then I was like, okay, great. So what is the how does the algebra derivative relate to the ordinary derivatives? Um, so I can figure that out. By definition, the derivative with respect to algebra is the differential at one. But here one is one two. So this is the differential. The differential actually works out to, it's so cool, right? So the identity of the algebra is 1, 2. So the d, d, z is actually partial, partial x plus 2, partial, partial y. It's kind of neat. Just like when the identity in the algebra is, is E1, then the, the, the complex derivative, d, f, d, z, is partial f, partial x for a complex differentiable function. If you make the identity E2, the dfdz is partial f partial y. That's also in his equations in the papers. Um, I suppose I've been aware of that. But um, anyway, so then I was like, fine, great. Here's my algebra. Let's come up with some functions. So uh, <laughs> I thought, how about e to the z, otherwise known as e to the x comma y, otherwise known as the sum n equals 0 to infinity of x, y to the n divided by n factorial. Now, this does not give me joy, so I rewrite it in such a way as to not do the calculation. So I split off my identity and my imaginary unit, and I do the usual calculus, which is that that goes to the exponential, and this goes to co cosine plus sine, appropriately multiplied by the unit and the uh, imaginary unit. So, th so through the usual calculations, there's your exponential. I didn't do anything with this, by the way, but there it is. It occurred to me I didn't really want to take partial derivatives of this and compare because that would be a mess. Why make my life difficult? I'm looking for a counterexample. Find an easier function to deal with. What's easier but not completely? You don't want to go linear. If you go linear, then you, it's too simple. You have linear polynomials which are solutions to all kinds of algebras, and yet they're not. You know, there are solutions which are linear that are simultaneously solutions to the wave equation and the... Uh, um, Laplace equation, for example. So at the level, level of linear functions, you cannot detect the difference between hyperbolic and elliptical PDEs. Uh, you, need, you need like higher order stuff. So quadratic is the first place where I think it's fun. And so with respect to my algebra, assuming it's not wrong, which is assuming a lot, since we have, I mean, shade has been thrown upon my algebra, if we were to use the vernacular of the day. Um, so z squared is this times this, which is that, which is, yeah, these guys. So you got your minus 3x squared. You got yourself a minus 10x squared. You got yourself a 2xy, a 6xy over here. And yeah, minus 2y squared, minus y squared. I'm assuming all throughout the ordinary scale. I, you know, if I don't have ordinary scalar multiplication, I don't, I don't even know where to start, guys, because... Ordinary scalar multiplication on R2 is built into everything that I do. That's woven into the, this, like the basic discussions of Cauchy-Riemann equations and you know, linear transformations on R2. Everything, the standard matrix, it's all based on standard scalar multiplication. If we're, if we're modifying the definition of scalar multiplication on R2, I'm in big trouble. I mean, I don't even know. No. No. It is forbidden. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so I take these and I feed them. Here's the p r equals 1 case. Arbitrary p1 and p2, that's what it looks like. r equals 2 case, arbitrary p1 and p2, that's what it looks like. All right? Again, corresponding to the different row reductions of the system we talked about last time. 
I'm assuming that the geodesibility on space paper is really logically equivalent to the algebraization of planar vector fields paper. Anyway, um, translating it into UV notation, this is partial U partial Y equals minus P1 partial V partial X. And this guy is partial V partial Y partial U partial equals partial U partial X minus P2 partial V partial X. Or in R equals 2 case, we've got partial V partial, what? No, wait, excuse me, partial V partial X is that one. Minus P equals minus P1 partial U partial Y. This one would read partial U partial X equals to partial V partial Y minus P2 partial U partial Y, which is what I wrote here. So here's equations one and two with respect to the P1 and P2 parameters. Besides this, we've got the direct product algebra. I haven't checked that. But these ones do not work. When I plug in the quadratic function, there's no choice of P1 and P2, which makes me admit that the square function is a differentiable with respect to any of the P1, P2 in either, in either the R equals 1 or R equals 2 case. I cannot find a choice of P1 or P2 which satisfies the cauchy riemann equations because when I plug in the quadratic, I get these conditions which pretty straightforwardly lead me to, you know, like P1 is 1 tenth and then over here P1 is 1 third. Well, I can't have both, right? And down here, I get P1 equals to 10. I get P1 equals to 3. We, uh, you can't do both of those. I can get one. I can get the other. I can't get both. And that's just one of the equations. I haven't even, I mean, I think there's probably something bad to learn about P2 down here as well. If I had to look at it. Well, that's the point, is this is an a-differentiable function with respect to this algebra I just constructed. And yet, it does not have functions which are differentiable with respect to any of the special class that is given in the papers. The claim is that those classes should characterize all possible differentiable functions, even though it's not all possible algebras. This? Oh, what, what I'm saying is that this is, this, to my taste, this is the complex numbers in a weird notation. Okay. This is the complex numbers with the unity being 1, 2, and the, uh, the identity being, well, the it's usual. Still yeah, it's still, it's, as a point set, it's still R2. Okay. All right. Now, King is worried that, and I would like to believe him, that my algebra is not an algebra, that I cannot have my 1, 2 unit and have, have peace in our time, that there is some kind of malevolent non-associativity which has been born of my, my desire to make a, a unity be one comma two. But I don't know. Do you want me to go, you want me to check associativity with the Anyway, you guys understand my consternation because I really did not see an error in the proof I showed you guys last time. Like, I believe his argument. So I didn't think, I was hoping that when I do this, it was going to work out, you know? The first first page? Yeah. This one. Sweetly. So King, you're telling me I should pick on what? E1 times E2 times E2 versus E1, E2, E2, 
right? That's what I should pick on? OK. So All right, so I got to look at my, let me look up my multiplication table. I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. Allegedly, E1, E1 is minus, minus 3 comma minus 10, minus 2. Now, if my error is in the middle, this isn't going to help find where the error is, of course, but uh, at least I'll see that the multiplication table is an error, right? Um, all right, so we got E1, E2 is 1, 3. <laughs> yeah. That uh, definitely doesn't look associative. Huh. All right. Ah. Uh. So I do not have, I do not have an algebra here. My world is smaller. For me, algebras are associative. I used to believe in non-associatively algebras, but these days I insist on associativity. Yeah. Dang it. So. Goodness gracious. I was so happy about this way of building the algebra. It seems so nice and neat and uncomplicated. I should have known something was wrong. Oh. Well, it's not a counterexample yet. Hooray. Right? So we're back to the question that we were at last time. How do you build an algebra that's got unit 1, 2? Can you do it? Hmm? And I insist that we leave the scalar multiplication as it is. I mean, you can, you, can, you can do something very silly where you basically make the 1, 2 direction the x direction and the perpendicular the y direction and do scalar multiplication with respect to these axes, which is really not what we're trying to do. <laughs> oh, 
all that's what you're thinking about doing. I mean, I need, I need the interface between the standard scalar multiplication and the non-standard algebra basis. I have to leave the standard scalar multiplication alone because that's built into everything else we've done up to this point. I can't go messing with that. Uh huh. Okay, what was it? Oh, okay. I think for some reason, like the equation right there, if you're doing E1 and 2, for some reason I found that that guarantee that E1 is equal to negative infinity is an actual thing. Oh. So you said E1, E2. Well, let's see. Ah. So e, e1, e2 is equal to, what did I say, 1 comma 3, right? Which is 1 comma 2, right? Plus e2. So e1, e2 is equal to the 1 in the algebra plus the i in the algebra, so to speak. Wait, 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 wait. Where'd that two go? Would be a much less exciting reason for this being not working. Oh, what would that say? <laughs> it changes everything. <laughs> so we got E1, E2. And what is it? 1, 2, E2, right? Minus, what was it, 2 times. Minus 1, minus 2 is what I should have had, right? And this should be E2 again because 1, 2 is the identity, right? So that should give me 0, 1 minus, well, plus rather, 2, 4, right? So E1, E2 should actually be 2, comma, 5. 2, comma, 5. And so we've got E1, E2 is 2, comma 5. We've got E1, E1 is what? Is that calculation at least legit? Probably not, because it's based on E1, E1. Let's work that out. Let's work it out. What's E1, E1? So we've got E1 plus 2, E2 um, minus 2, E2. E1 plus 2, E2 minus 2, E2, which is... 1 comma 2 minus 2e2 two e two times 1 comma 2 minus 2e2, two e two, which should give me 1 comma 2 minus 2e2 two e two minus 2e2 two e two plus 4e2e2. Two e two. So that gives me 1, 2, minus 0, 4, plus 4 times minus 1, minus 2, which gives me what? Minus 3. Minus 6. I'm just thinking, sorry, I was thinking backwards. Oh, you're, 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 you're you were, I was just adding it in. You were calculating. Yeah, yeah, minus 
minus 10, yeah. All right, so if the real multiplication table would please stand up, here it is. You got yourself E1, E2, E1, E2, E1, E1, minus 3, minus 10, all right, now let's check associativity. <laughs> and I think you're right, King. If we can check associativity on the basis, we have associativity on this space. Yeah. We could take this thing and feed it to the associator and make it associative. But no one wants to do that. <laughs> the associator. Is that, what's that? A little violent. A little violent. <laughs> okay, so we got E1. I should try E1, E2, E2 versus E1, E2, E2, right? So we got E1 minus 1 minus 2, which is minus, what is that? That's minus E1 E1 minus 2 E1 E2, which is apparently 3 comma 10 minus 2 times 2 comma 5, which is giving us minus 1. Zero. All right. And on the other hand, this one, if we calculate that way, we've got what? E1, E2 is 2, 5. What I do? Oh, yeah, 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 that would have been much, much faster, right? And that's encouraging that it's working out like that now. Thank you. That's a good point. So this is actually minus 1 times E1 times 1, 2, which is minus E1, which is... That that kind of calculation starting to make sense gives me hope. I don't think that was actually happening over there. <laughs> right? But let's not look back. Look forward. Uh, so what's this? 2e1e2 e plus 5e2e2, e which gives us 2 times 2, 5, plus 5 times minus 1 minus 2, which equals 2, 4 minus 5, which is minus 1, and 10 minus 10, which is 0. Oh, yeah. So, but, you know, thank you, King. That is very helpful. I should have checked associ associativity. is something you should always check because it's a non-trivial thing to see past an error you've made in some kind of construction, something like this. It's a good thing to check. It's really, it's really helpful. What's up? Oh, yes, yes. E1 and E2 are still the standard basis. This has not changed. <laughs> now, admittedly, I've just chosen one of many possible triples to check, but have you checked others, King? Uh, there's one over there, but uh, I haven't checked. <laughs> oh, okay. But the other, how many have you checked? Uh, I've checked. You, uh, just two. Just two? Okay. And they're good. I, I'm going to assume it works out at this point. Okay. <laughs> You're checking, yes. Okay. So if this is the actual algebra, now let's look for the squared function, right? Let's calculate the square function in this thing. Well, you know what, guys? I'm really glad that we could talk about this today. And I'm also equally glad that uh, we actually couldn't meet tonight because that he couldn't meet with me tonight. It's just as well because... I'm glad. It would have been a very frustrating conversation for both of us, I think, and 
So this is good. What's that? An Infinity War. <laughs> Infinity War. Yeah, it's probably he's probably gone to watch Infinity War. That's what it is. Let's hear. Uh, Z squared. Z squared. <laughs> Um, so we're looking at, um, how's it go, um, E1x plus E2y, E1x plus E2y, right? And so we've got E1, E1x squared plus 2, E1, E2, xy plus E2, E2, y squared. Now I've, you guys have to remind me, what did E1, E1 work out to? Negative 3, 10? Oh, negative 3, negative 10, x squared. And what did E1, E2 work out to? 2, 5. And then this, of course, was minus 1, minus 2, can't forget that. What we got? We've got minus 3x squared plus 4xy minus y squared and minus 10x squared plus 10xy minus 2y squared. There's my component functions. There's u. There's v. Now we calculate ux, uy, vx, vy. What do we get? Now let's uh, run it, run it through the machine. Start with case one, and I'll write down the generic. I'll write down the generic case one, and then I'll plug in. So generic, you help me out. This is generic case one. Says what? U y equals to what? Negative p one v x. That's it. And what else? V y, yep. God bless the abbreviated partial notation. Okay, so yeah. Now we plug in these guys, and I'll admit I'm still kind of hoping it doesn't work. I'm a I'm a I'm a bad person. Because I've spent a lot of time on this, and if it just works, I'd be like, oh, you know, you're right. I really hope it works. Because if it doesn't work, then, well, I mean, it'd be a blessing and a curse. It would mean that I've got a lot more to do. Um, that is true. It is a mental defect that we have. Um, we're only happy if we have problems. That's, that's true. But I have another problem, so I should still be happy, you know? Currently, have the problem of how do I watch the Infinity War without my children? Let's see here. Vy, 10, 10x minus 4y, and our ux was what? Minus, minus 6x plus 4y, minus p2, which was minus 20x plus 10y. So what's this give us? Let's sort through this here. Let's face the, check the damages. So we've got 4 plus 20 P1, or rather minus 20 P1, right? X minus 2. And how many Y's do I got? 10, right? 
that's this equation. And the other one, I've got 10x. So right? Yeah, if we can choose any, we can make that, we have complete freedom. We, if we can, we can choose p1 and p2 to be something that works, then great. Bam, we're done. Yeah. But if no, if the, like, you know, like we were looking at before, my original equations <laughs> left us no such flexibility. This much I know they're constants. Um, so I got 10. I got what? Plus 6. Any other x's? Oh, yeah. But I got a minus and a minus and to bring it, so I think it's minus 20. P2. And then my y's, well, I guess plus minus 4. Hey. Eh. Um, I'll go back, I'll come back to it in just a second here. Um, so in here you said it was wrong? I think you have minus quantity 2 plus 10 P1. I think it's 2 minus 10 P1. So I should put a plus here. And I should put a minus 2 here to be right? Yeah. Okay. So if I put P1 equal to 1 fifth in the top one, yes. it's good. And how about the bottom one? And that solves both? P2 is 4 fifths. And that makes both of these zero? Fine, this paper's right. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Hmm. I usually make mistakes at the end of something, not at, right in the middle. This is very unusual, uncharacteristic of me to make a mistake at that point in the calculation. Like, I usually make mistakes much later on. But right in the middle of it, you know, this uh, thing we were looking at. Well, it works for one example. It must be true for all, right? No, I, but I, again, I think the argument we went through last time, it makes sense. So I, I, I still also think there's value in doing what Cooper said in terms of actually putting down the structure constants and actually suffering through the row reductions, keeping track of what happened to the specific structure constants in the row reduction. I feel like I might get a better sense. And the other, the other looming issue here is there's something very ad hoc about setting order, the ordering of the equations, ux, then u, what was it, ux, vx, uy, vy, whatever the order was. What if you'd ordered it differently? The three cases would be different. You know? I mean, maybe the choice of ordering is specifically so that we get units which are E1 and E2, which is nice. It's nice to have the identity being E1 or E2. Right? You've seen what happens when it's not. Maybe that's, maybe that's actually intentional in that paper to do it that way, so precisely so that we get a family of algebras where the units are either E1 and E2. That turns out to be very, very useful for the calculation that I'm doing because there are two parts. Um, here, I'll show you guys. I'll show you guys the start of it. It's still, you know, in progress or whatever, but... Uh, Where'd that thing go? So, you know, I'm trying to, you know, and this is, again, this is just like the first in 
hopefully in many steps in what we're doing, but uh, where is my laser? Ah, thank you. All right, so I'm trying to take either one, two, three, or four, and so there's two things that have to happen. The one thing is I have to realize how to rewrite u and v as w. In other words, as an algebra variable, w, and with respect to some algebra. But at the same time, I need to convert the ux and vx into a derivative with respect to that same algebra. So like change them into a ddz is how I'm thinking about it. So if my algebra is one with unit e1, well, guess what? That's already a, a z derivative. That's already a z derivative, effectively. So if I just group these, I've got ddz of u comma v equals to f comma g. And then the question becomes, is f comma g actually differentiable with respect to that kind of algebra? If it is, great. We've got an algebraization, and I can solve it by separation of variables. So like, here's, here's case one. So I like, you know, I take, I've got ux equals to f, I've got vx equals to g. I, you know, look at, I look in, in his r equals one family of algebras. So look at f equals to f, you know, big F equals to f comma g. Grouping these, um, I have, I mean, I've got partial f, partial v, and, oh, I've forgotten something else. Curses. Oh, it's worse. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting something. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm apparently not in the place where I can explain it to people yet, but <laughs> anyway, the point is, it's actually very nice to be working with algebras with unit because then I can trade my partial partial x for partial z, right? But then if that, if that fails, if that fails, then I have to try for the second case, in which case partial partial x is no good. I need to trade, you know, partial v. This tells me partial v partial y uh, curses. Where is it? So I find like partial u partial y is that, and partial v partial y is that. These are my z derivatives if I take y, if you take e2 to be the unit. So I need to like um, convert my original system to look more like that, and then look at the algebraizability of this, not f comma g, but it's related but different um, function, or from his thinking, vector field. But anyway, I eventually get these conditions. There's one... So either I solve the box condition that was up here, or I solve the box condition that box conditions down there. If I can solve these box conditions for some choice of p1 and p2, then that means I can choose an algebra in which I can solve that system of PDs by separation of variables, which is the first example of a solution to the inverse problem that I've posed. You know, how can we take a system of PDs and convert it to an algebra differential equation and solve it? It's progress in this direction. And so apparently, we have a catalog of the two-dimensional algebras to work with. He has a collaborator who's working on the three-dimensional three-dimensional version of this, but it's not. I mean, they think they have a complete catalog. It's in that geodesibilities of uh, vector fields on space. But they haven't proven that it's a complete catalog. But after having seen the calculation that we went through, you start to understand how you could do it. Right? If you had a three-dimensional algebra, You've got so many structure constants. How many cauchy riemann equations do you got? n squared minus n. Six. You have six cauchy riemann equations. How many partial derivatives are they constraining? Nine. So you have six equations in nine unknowns. And then you have to sort through different possible row reductions. That's why if you look ahead at their system, at their classification of three-dimensional vector, three-dimensional algebras in the vector fields, which are algebraizable over them, it's so much worse. So many more cases. And yet, I think I can see how this would actually give us a clear path to finding a tedious but clear path for all possible algebras 
with, with over three dimensions. And then it's just a matter of uh, just a matter of calculation. I can keep going. I think. Ah, well, we always have the product rule. Yeah. We always have the chain rule. Yeah. So is the squared function differentiable? It is because it's the, you know, it's the, pro it's the product of, of the identity function with itself. So by the product rule, I have derivative of the identity function times the identity function plus the identity function times derivative of the identity function. And that works out to 2z arbitrary algebras. So I have a proof of the, I mean, I, in fact, I have a proof of the power rule for integer powers for any algebra. It's certainly commutative. Possibly non-commutative. I, I, I just haven't thought enough about it. Yeah. I mean, it's not as much trouble. It's like, you remember advanced calculus. I like to do the aha. It's not even that bad because we're commutative, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I just needed writing. That's right, I do the cube one, and it starts to become a, <laughs> that's my mathematical maniacal laugh. Let's find the, the differential of x to the n of h. No, I did. Hannah? But everybody still writes it. They still don't get it squared. I had a problem with bananas. I solved for x, and you work it out, and it's bananas. Oh, that one. Some okay. People would just, like, not write it out. Oh, I know. They would just leave it as n squared. Yeah, it's no good. No, the problem's only bananas if you if you don't use exponent exponential notation. That's right. Yeah. They just not fun like us. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you guys for uh, helping me find the error of my ways. I um now feel more like I should, uh, for my own purposes, come up with a complete and ungappy proof of the claim of the last paper for my future educational purposes. And also it's just an interesting theorem that basically elementary row operations on systems of linear PDEs don't change the solutions set. That actually gives you a kind of like really, really neat linear algebra example, which I would never have thought of. Like, what's another use for row reductions? Well, you find solutions to linear PDEs, right? Because if you did the right, I mean, you could have a strategy to try to reduce them in such a way that you could integrate them, you know, one by one and bootstrap your way back up to the whole thing, something like that. So. Any questions? So Wednesday, I should do uh, manifolds. Is that right? We got what, man Wednesday and Monday? Monday yeah. got, I got two days left. What's that? During the final, for the fine period, that'd be good. Maybe we could put something together then. I'll have to think about it. But we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let Kang present our paper during that period. Our paper on the uh, either one. The papers that we were we were writing that we haven't written yet, but we're gonna write. Yeah. I should probably. Are you busy with stuff? It's okay. I mean, we can work on it during exam week. It's fine. Mm. Mm. It is actually very, it's a weight off my shoulders because it gives me confidence that I can go back and finish this because I finished cases one two and three I need to go go finish case four and I still haven't there's some things like in the process of the calculation I assume p1's non-zero I need to go 